if you had the power to dream at night any dream you wanted to dream. And you would, of course, be able to alter your time sense and slip, say, 75 years of subjective time into eight hours of sleep. You would, I suppose, start out by fulfilling all your wishes. You could design for yourself what would be the most ecstatic life. Love affairs, banquets, dancing girls, wonderful journeys, uh, gardens, music beyond belief. And then after a couple of months of this sort of thing at 75 years a night, you'll be getting a little uh, taste for something different. And uh, you would move over to an adventurous dimension where there were certain dangers involved and the thrill of dealing with dangers. And you could rescue princesses from dragons and go on dangerous journeys, make wonderful explosions and blow them up, eventually get into contest with enemies. And after you'd done that for some time, you'd think up a new wrinkle to forget that you were dreaming so that you would think it was all for real and to be anxious about it. And then, uh, because it'd be so great when you woke up, and then you'd say, well, like children who dare each other on things, how far out could you get? What could you take? What dimension of being lost, of abandonment of your power, what dimension of that could you stand? You could ask yourself this because you know you'd eventually wake up. And after you'd gone on doing this, you see, for some time, you would suddenly find yourselves sitting around in this room with all your personal involvements, problems, etc., uh, talking with me. How do you know that that's not what you're doing? Could be. Because after all, what would you do if you were God? If you were what there is, the self. In the Upanishads, the basic text of Hinduism, one of them starts out saying, in the beginning was the self. And looking around, it said, I am. And thus it is that everyone to this day, when asked who is there, says it is I. And thereafter gives whatever particular name he may have. For if you were God, and in the sense that you knew everything, and you were completely transparent to yourself through and through, you would be bored. Because if looking at it from another way, we push technology to its furthest possible development, and we had, instead of a dial telephone on one's desk, a more complex system of buttons, and one touch, beep, would give you anything you wanted. Aladdin's lamp. You would eventually have to introduce a button labeled surprise. <laughs> because all perfectly known futures, as I pointed out, are past. They have happened, virtually. It is only the true future is a surprise. So if you were God, you would say to yourself, man, get lost. And it's strange that this idea is obscurely embedded in the Christian tradition when in the epistle to the Philippians, St. Paul speaks of God the Son, the Logos, the Word of God, who is incarnate in Christ, and says, 
Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought not equality with God a thing to be clung to, but made himself of no reputation and humbled himself and was found in fashion as a man and became obedient to death. Same idea. Same idea as the idea of the dream. You're getting that very far out dream. Of getting as extreme as you can get. And so this then is the basis of the Hindu view of the universe and of man. The Hindu looks upon the universe as a drama. The Westerner, of course, looks upon the universe as a construct, as something made. And it is not therefore insignificant that Jesus was the son of a carpenter. The Chinese looks upon the universe as an organism, as we shall subsequently see. But the dramatic idea is basic to Hinduism. Now you can speak about Hinduism on two levels at least. One I will call the metaphysical level and the other the mythological level. If you speak on the metaphysical level, you can speak only in negative language. You can say what the divine, the ultimate reality is not. If you speak on the mythological level, you may speak of what the divine is like. Because myth is not a falsehood, as one uses the word in a sophisticated way. A myth is an image, a concrete image, in terms of which man makes sense of the world. And thus the idea of God the Father or God the Maker is a myth, because it's an image. And Christian theologians distinguish equally between two kinds of theological language, which are respectively called cataphatic and apophatic. Apophatic language is negative, as when we say God is infinite and eternal. Cataphatic language is mythological, as when we say God the Father, God is love, and all the positive designations. We are not saying God is a cosmic male parent, but is analogous with the Father. So with Hinduism. But what I'm going to speak to you in first of all is the mythological language of Hinduism. The idea of the universe as the big act. The universe is God playing hide and seek with himself. For God is thought of fundamentally to the Hindu as the self, the self, the cosmic I. And it is a basic proposition for the Hindu that only the Self, the Godhead, is real. There is nothing other than the Godhead. So that the appearance, uh, the feeling that there are other things than the Godhead is called Maya. Maya. We ordinarily translate that word illusion. But you must be careful about the word illusion. Illusion is related to the Latin ludere. And that means play. And this is why the analogy of the world is dramatic. It's a play. In the sense of a stage play. Now, when you go to the theatre, you know what you're going to see is not for real. Because the proscenium arch tells you that. That everything that happens on the far side of that arch is only in play, not serious. But the actor, and you will hope that he will be good at it, is going to try and persuade you that it's for real. So that he will so move you that you are crying or sitting 
in anxiety upon the edge of your chair. And so the audience is almost persuaded to be taken in. Now what about if this would happen with the very best actor of all, the great actor? The audience would, of course, be completely taken in. But in this case, of course, the actor and the audience are the same, the self. The self has thus the capacity to abandon itself, to forget itself, to hide from itself, and thus to make the most completely convincing illusion. But in play, and so the activity, the creative activity of the Godhead in Hinduism is called Leela, which means play. Our word lilt is related to it, I think. <laughs> but so also in the book of Proverbs, you will find a discourse being given by the divine wisdom. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways before his works of old. I think it's the 22nd chapter of Proverbs, in the course of which uh, the wisdom says that its delight was to rejoice, the King James Bible says, in the presence of God and with the sons of men. But the Hebrew translated rejoice says play. Rejoice is a sort of dignified Elizabethan, uh, but it says play. And St. Thomas, aware of this, said that the divine wisdom was above all to be compared with games, because games are played for their own sake and not for any sort of ulterior motive. So also music is a kind of non-purposive thing because you don't either play music to reach a destination nor do you dance to reach a particular place on the floor. It is the doing of it itself that is important because after all if the object of music were to gain a certain destination those orchestras that played fastest would be considered the best. So the, the, the idea is that, the, that dancing and music, more than other arts, represent the nature of this world. That it is playful, that it is sport. That it may be sincere, but is definitely not serious. And as G.K. Chesterton well put it once, the angels fly because they take themselves lightly. <laughs> how much more so the Lord of the Angels. So if a beautiful lady should say to me, I love you, and I were to reply, are you serious or are you just playing with me? That would be quite the wrong response because I hope she's not serious and that she will play with me. I should say, are you sincere or are you just toying with me? because you see the word play has many different senses. A person who is playing the organ in church is certainly not doing something trivial. When you go to see a play called Hamlet, you're not seeing something trivial. When the concert artist plays Mozart, he is certainly entertaining you, but it's not a trivial entertainment. But on the other hand, we would use play in a, in a quite a different sense when we mean just fooling around, doing it for kicks. So it is fundamental, as a matter of fact, to both the Hindu and the Christian traditions that the universe is the play of God. But the Christian thinks of it in the terms of a construction play, like building with blocks. And the Hindu thinks of it as dramatic play, of the actual participation of the Godhead in the creation, so that every being whatsoever is God in disguise. Hinduism speaks of the Godhead as, you uses the word Brahman. This is a neuter form in Sanskrit from the root Bri, which means to grow, to expand to swell. The neuter form, Brahman, 
uh, does not have quite the connotation then, you see, of kingship that we will find attached to the Western idea of God, but is also referred to as Atman. And this word, we translate ordinarily the self. So you can have the para param you put the m in to connect the particle paramatman which means para the supreme self uh, or sometimes just the atman alone and that means the self in you but the fundamental principle of indian philosophy is atman is brahman yourself is the supreme self or it is expressed in also in the formula tat tvam asi colloquially translated you're it or tat that tuam latin tuam you asi are you you are that that thou art uh, tat of course is uh, the first word uttered by a baby And fathers flatter themselves that it's saying da da. It's not. It's saying that. Da, 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 da. And so it's pointing to thatness in everything. It's very important to see this. Because um, everything is just that. Uh, I can say it in a negative way, which you won't appreciate at first, perhaps. Everything is meaningless. Only words have meaning. Because they point to something other than themselves. The sound water is undrinkable. <laughs> but it points to the drinkable reality. When you say, though, what is that pointing at the water? And somebody says, water, he's not being correct because what you're pointing at is not the noise water. So it's not water. It's that. Duh. And water's a kind of jazz. And uh, it's, it's just doing that. And uh, you can get to see too, people are a kind of jazz. They talk and communicate with each other, but what does that mean? Well, they get together and they make more people and they do this and they do that and they eat and they go on doing this jazz, but it's just jazz. You begin to see as you do that, everything's like music, you see. It's all these complicated vibrations. In all kinds of ways. That's that. Or thatness. Tathata, also called in Sanskrit. So anyway, this is the fundamental notion that you uh, are really what there is, the works. Only you're playing hide and seek with yourself. And on a stupendous scale, Hindus measure time in units which in Sanskrit are called kalpa. And a kalpa is a period of 4,320,000 years. And uh, there are two kinds of kalpa. One is called manvantara. And the other is called pralaya. Manvantara is the kalpa in which the universe is manifested, in other words, in which God puts on his big act, and pralaya is the succeeding kalpa in which the universe is unmanifested. And the Godhead does not dream, but is awake to its own nature. These are called respectively the days and the nights of the Brahman, and this goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. The days and nights adding up into years and centuries 
and eons. They speak of Kro, there's a Sanskrit measure, Kro, C-R-O-R-E, uh, a sort of a word that really I think means umpteen. Uh, Kro's of Kalpas. And uh, this is the in-breathing and the out-breathing. Uh, there's the word Hangsa. In this word in Sanskrit, Hangsa means a swan or a big water bird, like a gander. There's a myth that the, there is in the beginning the divine bird which lays the egg of the world. And the egg splits and the upper is the heavens and the lower is the earth. So when the worlds are manifested, the Lord breathing out says, Hung! And when the worlds are withdrawn, the breath comes back. Hung! But if you say hung sa hung sa hung sa hung it becomes sa hung sa hung sa a hung that means sa means that the truth a hung I am I am that <laughs> it's like uh, imagine uh, when we get uh, to the final moment in which the world is blown up. You know, imagine the countdown. This is the end. Somebody's pushed the button. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. What are you listening to? The sound of the waves. And you can sit and listen to the little waves on the seashore. And you'll get back here into this kind of thinking and you're hearing the ocean of the universe going. And that's your breathing too. It's all one rhythm. So it may be that every star was once a planet populated by intelligent people who found out about the fundamental energy of the universe and blew themselves up. And as they blew up, they scattered all kinds of stuff out which became little planets. <laughs> which in a long time, life started all over again. Because the Hindu theory is very odd. Every Kalpa in the Manvantara period, where there's a manifested world, is divided into four subdivisions of time, each one of which is called a Yuga. That means roughly an epoch or an era. And the, there are four Yugas, and they're named after the different throws in the Indian game of dice. There are four such throws, and the first is called Krita. That means, kri means to do, as when we say something is done, truly done. It's the perfect throw of four. The second is called treta, which is the throw of three. The next is called dvapara, which is the throw of two. And the final one is called kali, which means the worst throw, which is the throw of one. Now, each of these periods of the Kalpa are of different lengths. Krita is the longest, and Kali is the shortest, and so ranged. So that when the world is first manifested, as in those dreams that I were mentioning to you, the world is in a golden age to begin with. It's perfect. And that is the longest period of time. Then when we get a little bit more adventurous, you see, uh, the Treta means that in this era, a kind of disharmonious element enters into things. It's like a three-legged chair isn't so secure as a four-legged chair. It's just a bit inclined to tip. 
and as it were, as a fly in the ointment, the snake in the garden. Then comes Dvapara, in which the forces of good and evil are equally balanced. And finally, Kali, which is the shortest period, where the forces of evil are triumphant, and the world is destroyed at the end of it. For then the Godhead appears in the form of Shiva, who represents the destructive aspect of the divine energy. And uh, whereas Brahma is the creative, Vishnu the preserver, Shiva the destroyer. But Shiva is always the destroyer in the sense of the liberator, the guy who breaks up the ruts. And he comes on with a blue body and ten arms and a necklace of skulls. Indian gods have many arms because they are cosmic centipedes. They do all things without having to think about it. Like the centipede doesn't have to think about how to manipulate its legs. Like you don't have to think how to grow your hair. And as Shiva dances what is called the Tandava, which is the dance of destruction at the end of the cycle, at the end of the Kalpa, you will see that his hands contain clubs and knives and bells, but one hand is like that. And that gesture means don't be afraid. It's a big act. It is all, as it were, the outflowing of your own consciousness, of your own mind. Now then, the Hindu life is related to this cosmology. And the objective of life is, of course, in the end, to wake up from the dream when you've had enough. And so the dreaming process is called sometimes samsara. Samsara um, is the round, the rat race. And uh, Sangsara is divided into six divisions. I better draw a map, I think. This is common, you see, cosmology to both the Hindus and the Buddhists. This is the world of the Deva. And through, this is the same route from which we get both divine and devil. The Deva means angel. The highest and most successful beings in the universe. And so opposite, this is the world of Narak, Naraka, who are the most unsuccessful. These are the purgatorial worlds of extreme suffering. This is the world of Ashura. They are also angels, but they're angry angels representing the, the wrath potential of energy. This is the world of animals. This is the world of preta, for which we have no English equivalent. They are hungry or frustrated spirits who have enormous stomachs but mouths only the size of needles. Vast appetite and no means of fulfillment. And this is the manu world that is to say, the world of man. You don't have to take this literally. Uh, you could say, when you are extremely happy or ecstatic, you are here. When you are miserable, you are here. When you are dumb, you are here. When you are mad, you are here. When you are frustrated, you are here. But when you are more or less your normal, rational self, you are here. Now, so, uh, you, the, all life through the period of the Kalpas goes grinding around this wheel. And if you go up and you succeed and you get to the top, you have to come down. They don't see success, in other words, in the world as a method of liberation because it implies failure. So, uh, the idea of liberation which is called moksha, it 
is the ideal of Hindu life. Wake up, it's a dream. And in time, there is no hope in time. Everything is going to get worse in time. Because as you know, it does. We all fall apart in the end. Everything falls apart. Institutions, buildings, nations, it all crumbles. And people say, well, that's an awfully pessimistic philosophy. Well, is it? I would rather say that the people who have hope in the future are the miserable people. Because they're like donkeys chasing carrots that are dangled before their noses from sticks attached to their collars. And they pursue and they pursue in vain, always hoping that tomorrow will be the great thing and therefore incapable of enjoying themselves today. People who live for the future never get there because when their plans mature, they are not there to enjoy them. They're the sort of people who spend their lives saving for their old age and trying to teach their children to do the same thing so that when they retire at 65, you know, they have false teeth and wrinkles and prostate trouble and all that sort of thing. Uh, where were you going? What did you think it was all about?